So yeah, there you go. So welcome everybody. It's Monday, April 25th or Tuesday, April 26th. Take your choice. And this is uh, Jim and Jory with our Open Hearted Practice Group. And we're gonna continue our exploration of the 28 skills of the Pathways to Liberation Matrix of Self-Assessment today and explore transcending roles. And we can also talk about biscuits too, if you want, but mostly we're gonna be focusing on roles. <laughs> talking to Maureen before the beginning of the call and she's in Marietta uh, visiting folks and that's where I grew up so it started me it started me thinking about biscuits and gravy and um, even though I was not my parents were not southerners we certainly had our share of southern food and Jory how are you I'm doing much better I had a rough day today a little bit I'm dealing with some stuff with the my dental stuff and uh, went down my little rabbit hole for a while, feeling sorry for myself, but I came back out, which is nice. It's just part of being human, like it happens. And I always have to remember this too shall pass. And here it is, it has, and I'm glad to be here. Great, I think I see some new faces or actually I see some new names on screens. I think Vitalina might be here for the first time. I'm not sure, but welcome, I'm glad to see you. And uh, there's Donna, welcome. Hey, Monica. So uh, this, this is a practice group in nonviolent communication, a process created by the late Marshall Rosenberg. And Jory and I have been offering practice groups in this work for about 20 years now. And we moved online during the COVID pandemic, the early days of the COVID pandemic, because we couldn't do our practice group at our house anymore. So we started to do it online and suddenly we had a, a, a wonderful international community. And as you can see here, we got folks from Taiwan and India and Canada and all over the United States and maybe some other places, Singapore. And that's just really uh, fun for us, at least for me, and to have to have gathered around us an international community. And for me, it just points to the universal uh, applicability, the usefulness of NVC, nonviolent communication across all cultures. Yeah, that it really points to our our shared humanity, our the the parts that are are within all of us. We sometimes get lost in what we think we are, or you know, what's the right, wrong, and all those other games. And then we get together with people from all around the world and we see a lot of it is culture. And that for me has been a big opening to our shared humanity. Yeah. So Jory and I entered the world of nonviolent communication in the year 2000 when we met Marshall Rosenberg <clears throat> and we went there um because of our role in the world at the time was mediator it was a role that we liked to play we were volunteer mediators uh, in albuquerque um, uh, justice system and uh, albuquerque was a forerunner in creating restorative justice strategies in the united states and jory and i were um, doing all kinds of mediation work and uh, that had started about seven or eight years before uh, Marshall visited us. We'd never heard of Marshall Rosenberg before he came in and offered us training for one of our volunteer organizations. It was uh, the court program, court, they often call them a court annex program for Bernalillo County, which is the, the big population uh, center of, um, of New Mexico. And Jory and I had been doing mediation work for about seven years, and we heard about this guy, Marshall Rosenberg, and he was some kind of peacemaker and, and um, a trainer. And Jory and I loved making peace, and we also loved training. We would take just about any training that would come our way. So we decided to get up and uh, go and take that training. And within about 15 minutes, my life had changed for the better because uh, my I thought that what I was learning from Marshall was going to really enhance my role as a mediator. And what I found out was the skills and the consciousness of nonviolent communication helped me in all the roles that I play in life. 
And so we're happy to have this opportunity to share with you and practice together. <clears throat> you know, I emphasize the word practice because um, we like to set up opportunities for you to practice rather than doing a whole lot of teaching. Sometimes we end up doing some teaching, of course, to get some certain comment, uh, concept across or something like that. But today, I think we're going to have like a series of little dialogues where you can have in small groups to explore certain things. We'll start with a little written practice. So this is a, <clears throat> a typical uh, way we often practice here with a little self-empathy first, then honesty and empathy. And we always begin with some kind of a self-connection exercise. And all a self-connection exercise means is a chance that you just use nonviolent communication to get present and to get clear on your intention and in being here. So while I'm guiding you in that practice, then Jory will be making small groups for you, probably groups of three. There might be a group of four or a group of two, depending on how things lay out. To make it easy for her, uh, there's a couple of requests. Number one, you'll see some people have an equal sign in front of their name. That's not a political statement that they're in favor of equality, although maybe it is. Um, we we use it to uh, denote or symbolize that you don't want to be in a small group. I can't, I, I understand why some people might want to do that because they're in the middle of multitasking or driving or some other thing. So if that's you, then just put an equal sign in front of your name. And um, that tells Jory not to put you into a group where there's an expectation that people will talk. <clears throat> Secondly, if you, uh, oh, go ahead. You want to say it, oh, go ahead. I was going to make sure you said that. Go ahead. Yeah. You've got the language. Go ahead. Yeah. Secondly, we, we, we really encourage you to practice in your uh, preferred language. And so even if you're not a native English speaker and you want to practice in a, because you want to practice in Japanese, say, <clears throat> you're free to choose Japanese as a language. I see that we have a couple of folks, um, Japanese speakers today and maybe at least one Mandarin speaker, maybe two. <clears throat> so if you're willing to practice in another language, just add that to your name as well, so that it help, just helps us to divide up the groups. With that said, we'll go ahead and get started with our self-connection exercise. So start right where you are. You're already doing it. Really, a self-connection exercise is a reminder that you're always connecting to something. So what are you connecting to right now? Where, where is your focus? Maybe you're looking at the screen or maybe you're still settling down. Maybe you are doing some kind of a multitasking thing. Maybe you're driving a car. Just notice what it is that you're actually involved with in this moment. And see if you can come up with a label that describes the role that you're playing right now. Like for example, I, the label that I might apply in this moment is trainer. And the role I'm playing is training. Maybe I could also call myself leader because I'm leading a group right now. So just bring awareness to the role that you're playing in this moment. And find out if it's a role you want to play. One way you can determine whether you want to be playing this role is to consider how you feel about it. What feelings are alive in you right now? If the feelings are pleasant, then you're probably playing a role you're enjoying right now. If the feelings you have are unpleasant, that might be an indication that there might be another more fun role for you to play.
For those of you who are here last week, we were exploring power. So for the last part of this exercise, I invite you to close your eyes only if you want to. And keep them open if you prefer to keep them open. But if you choose to close your eyes, it just might support more a more deepening of self connection. And think back to the last seven days since we were together. And if you weren't here last week, you can still do the exercise. But think about power and how you shared power over the last week. This is a new concept for you. Here's a couple of ways you might have shared power. Maybe you gave a gift to somebody because they asked you for something and you shared your access to resources by giving them a gift. Or Maybe you shared your power by making a request. For me, whenever I share a request, it's a reminder that I'm inviting someone else to taste their power, their power to contribute to my life. So if you made any requests this last week, that's an example of sharing power. Maybe you noticed something about how things are usually happen in your household or at work when you are in a position with potential to have power over and instead of behaving in a habitual way, you made a different choice and invited more shared power. That's something that might have happened this last week. So notice these opportunities for sharing power and notice how you feel as you participate in that world. And connect the feelings that you have to needs that were satisfied for you when you shared power. You might also notice you missed some opportunities to share power. That's very human. Probably happened for all of us. A moment where we made a demand or we blamed or we criticized. You'll notice that we have those old habits and mourn, mourn those lost opportunities to share power and mourning just means to be present with your own sadness without making yourself wrong From that place of mourning, you can acknowledge that no matter whether you shared power or not in a given moment, you were doing the best you could to get needs met. And you might have learned something in the process. That's what we human beings do. We, we try to meet some needs. We find out whether our strategies work or not, and then we learn something. Try to do more of the things that meet needs and less of the things that don't. Then you end up celebrating 
not only the giving and the receiving, but also the growing, the learning. So as a final step in the exercise, just what did you learn this last week about sharing power? And if your eyes have been closed, you can open them up again, look around your space, reorient yourself to this, <clears throat> this new moment. While I've been running my mouth, Jory's been running the computer keyboard, getting small groups ready. So I imagine she set the timer for about 10 minutes. And there's a minute or two at the end. So when the group, uh, when the small group ends, you don't need to do anything. You can just relax and eventually you'll get zoomed back here. So what are you supposed to do in this small group? You get to practice empathy and honesty. Honesty simply refers to what I've been doing during the last few minutes and sharing authentically what's going on in me. So it's a chance for you to express, to share the life that's in you. The more you can connect your experience to your own feelings and needs, the more vulnerable and connecting it's likely to be for the listeners. So you can talk about what you liked about this exercise, or you could talk about what you didn't like about this exercise. You could talk about whatever is authentically so for you, either about the exercise or about nonviolent communication in general about Zoom, about your life, about the idea of power and sharing power, whatever is alive in you, you get a chance to share. And then about two thirds of the time, you'll be listening. And that's your chance to practice empathy. I see your hand, uh, Siva. Can you hold it? And maybe, yeah, let's hold it until after the self connection. No, exercise. <laughs> no you got, you I, I want to know. I want to know. It, in the past, I was able to get the closed caption. Oh, it's, it should be on. It's turned on. I, yeah, so just click on the little CC on the okay, bottom. Okay, now, now I see it, but it wasn't there before. Good, I'm it glad was we got that. Apps. Yeah. Okay, good. Good, I'm glad I got that fixed. So anyway, <clears throat> when you're listening, you get to practice empathy. And we're going to invite you to do silent empathy during the small groups. And that just means that only one person is going to be talking at a time the speaker, and the rest of the time we can be focusing our attention on the heart of the speaker. When we're listening, we can just focus on the heart of the speaker. And what I mean by that is listening for feelings and needs. Gori? And it's helpful to have a timekeeper so that everybody gets the chance to speak. So right away, if you're willing to be the timekeeper in your group, would you volunteer for that? And uh, that will bring some balance in there. Okay, so I'm gonna open up the groups. There are some of you that have come in. Zooming back, hey Zohar, I see your hands raised, go ahead. You're still there, Joe. Yeah, okay. Um, so I, um, I had a week with a lot of opportunities to share, to share power and I missed most of them. And, um, but I feel like I got a gift out of all these little failures and it was, um, noticing this voice in me that when I was angry about something that was happened, that something that happened, I, I was not happy with something that happened. I, I had this urge to punish the other person. And I mean, I'm talking, it's about most of that happened with my daughter. 
So I think a lot of parents, they feel this in, like very immediately that, oh, I should teach her a lesson. She should know. I should put some boundaries. It should be clear. But the way that I, I observed it was, so how did I get this way of thinking? Because I'm probably um, having the same voice, the same attitude for my friends, for my partner and their adults. So it's not only in the parent-child relationship, it can show up in other relationships in my life too. And I was just thinking, how did I get this program so deep in me that I wasn't even noticing it until now? And how can I move on from this? And not be just checking different strategies like I do, for example, with my daughter. Because I still hear this voice in the back of my head saying, oh, no, no, you're too permissive. No, you're too understanding. You're accepting. No, you should teach her a lesson. So how do I relate to this voice um, so I can shift things for myself first? Just that you recognize that you're doing that is huge. That makes a big difference. And a lot of this programming comes from our parents or our teachers or whatever when we're very young. So that's where it comes from. But I, I'm sure I've said this a hundred times because it lives inside of me. Recognition is simultaneous with liberation. Every time you recognize it, you are actually in a place where you are able to then realize there's another choice. So just that you're recognizing it, I celebrate. And I also mourn with you that we have these kinds of programming. How is it for you to hear that so far? Um, I, um, I feel that you um, share my, my pain, my grief about it and um it actually really opens my heart what you said that recognition and liberation is uh, are simultaneously happening yeah. thank you helps us to stop throwing darts at ourselves yeah thank you so far <laughs> yeah, there, this morning this morning i was on another call with an old friend of joy's jory and, and i uh, from the spiritual community where we met. <clears throat> it was a, a, a group of people that were are focused on becoming certification candidates. And it, it came out during the same kind of an issue came out during the call, uh, um, not necessarily related to the kind of story that you were telling, but it's such a common story as we have these missed opportunities to share power and so forth. And, and um, our friend River, who's a certified trainer in Philadelphia, he he reminded us, reminded me of something that we learned in that spiritual community where we met those, those uh, almost 45 years ago now. Uh, and it's just a question to ask your, yourself. Can I grow a heart big enough to accept myself when I make these mistakes? And for me, that just encapsulates the sense of warmth and resonance and empathy and compassion that, yeah, we got programmed, we got educated in a certain way. And can we have compassion for ourselves, uh, even, even in the midst of that? So that's my gift I give to you from our friend River today. How do you feel hearing that? Yeah, it's, it's very supporting. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So and we'll move to Karen. Again, a really cool exercise because um, in, in this breakout room, um, I had a realization that when I look back over my week, there was no uh, classic example of power over um, or power under. And I'm grateful for that, but, but I found it hidden someplace else that for me, um, looking over my week, that when I give, I'm sharing power. That if I, it, if I don't give, then I am not sharing my power. Mm -hmm. And, and if I don't, if I don't receive, then, then I am not sharing power either. Allowing someone to give to me is also sharing power with that person. Right. So 
giving and receiving is now seen from by me as a sharing power. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing your experience. And for me, that's the compassionate giving and receiving. Thank you so much. And Siva? This is, uh, you know, every week I think I say the same thing. This, this is such an important, fundamental core topic. And uh, it, for me, it fell at a perfect time because yesterday was, I was 83 years old. And, and so I've been, and uh, we've just, so there were two events yesterday uh, that where I, was able to celebrate my birthday and uh, learn. And so uh, for some of you know that the, the holiday, the Jewish holiday of Passover has just passed over for this year. And um, it celebrates the, the making of the Jewish people of the, the escape under the direction of Moses and God and that thing from the slavery of Egypt into the promised, in, into uh, this desert where food came from the sky. And uh, anyhow, but the very first thing that happened was that Moses goes up to the mountain and gets the rules for really relationship between people. And in English, we say, pay attention. And in Hebrew, that, that concept of pay attention, it, it's translated as put your heart, which is very, very different. Put your heart is about compassion and empathy. But pay attention. So I was wondering, what's the tension all about? I think the tension is between me needing to take care of myself and me needing to take care of my community. So the gift is really coming from the heart and, and uh, ha can I grow a big enough heart that I can feel any support that I give to anybody is a gift to myself and to my community. Thank you, Siva. Thanks, Siva. Like taking that in. Rena? Rena? Yeah, hi. Um, so I was um, today thinking about in the exercise the power that money has in, you know, as, as, it's not inherent, but it's the habitual, the conditioning that whoever has the money or whoever pays has the power. And, and then that brings up a whole lot of difficulties in giving or receiving. So I was, I was you know, in this exercise today, uh, going through uh, the experience of this week uh, and the three more days when my daughters, two daughters and, um, <clears throat> one son-in-law is visiting from Sri Lanka and, and they've had such difficult times over there. And I mean, emotionally difficult, of course, money is a part of it, but it's, it's more the, you know, the systemic uh, challenges around what's happening in Sri Lanka. Uh, so for me, it was important that when we are meeting together for, a month, for just a week and maybe two years or one year, how can I have this, this sense of togetherness and oneness and a sense of safety above all? And for me, money, I wanted to be careful around, you know, how, how they, they see if I am taking care of everything, you know? So it brought in me that whole awareness around how my intentions can land on each one of them and you know so so taking care of the impact as well over the three days and there are three more days so again this whole beauty of power in a family 
and through money. Uh, how, uh, what happens in the world uh, kind of lands in, in family. And, you know, it's like a, like a whole ecosystem of itself. So I am celebrating that uh, my awareness around um, care and choice, like my youngest daughter said that, no, mama, this time I want to pay. And without any discussion, just saying, yeah, okay, go ahead, you know. So it's beautiful to kind of be present to each one of them and to not compare because, you know, when you have three daughters who are about 30 and it's, it's so easy to compare and NVC and, and parenting has helped me to kind of just, just not compare, you know, to celebrate, to be present actually. So yeah, it, it brought up a whole lot of, um, I'm full right now, you know, with joy, with a sense of uh, that I, I, yeah, that removing the power element of money and holding it as a resource, as a shared, uh, you know, resource for us to take care of each other and celebrate when we are together. So I'm, I'm really, really very happy. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. And I, I'm grateful to my parents who have brought this sense of abundance in me. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Thank nice. you so much. Thank you for the celebration. Yeah. And Patricia? And for NVC to give me all these practices, you know, yeah. inside me to yeah. live the consciousness. Yeah. Lovely. And to Patricia? wanted to tell Zora that there are a lot of books on raising children in NVC um, and parenting in NVC and I my children I have adults I don't have children they're 40 and 40 and 51 um, but my daughter who's 40 is a nanny and I got really interested in this um, NVC group, um, books about parenting because she comes home and says, mom, I had a hard time such, you know, this happened, the kid wouldn't go to sleep and whatever. So I started having such an interest and in, well, what would NVC do? What, we you know, how to do this? And it's fascinating. So not only am I learning and to share with her when she asked me some stuff, I'm also learning something that I never thought I would learn. And that is that as the mom talking about roles, I'm the person that they come to for a soft landing. And that's the role that I, that's the role that I have with them. And I so much cherish that role and I want to expand it because one day I will need a soft landing myself when I can no longer take care of myself. So those books, um, Zora, are wonderful. I highly recommend that you um, send for them or get them. They're very, some, one of them is pretty big, but most of them are small. Yeah. Anyway. Thanks, Patricia. Yeah. yeah. And John? Well, first, uh, happy birthday, Siva. I am shocked to learn that you're in your 80s. I would have got that way wrong. Um, so happy birthday. And uh, I, a few months ago, I, I offered to somebody who I, I, I really like working with to share power with them and to co-teach a course that I had lined up all the students for. I, I planned to do it all by myself and visit some people in the course. Uh, who are taking it and also teaching it here. Um, and I, I did that and I fully meant it. And part of me was like, oh, I hope she doesn't take me up on that offer because, uh, you know, of sharing that power. Uh, <laughs> like, I, I wanted to, to have the full thing to myself. I wanted, and, but I, I lived with that discomfort and she did take me up on that offer and it has been wonderful. It, it has enriched the course so much. 
and led to so many other new opportunities. So that that shift from from wanting to keep it to myself to sharing has been very valuable. So, I share that. Sweet. Thank you for Happy sharing time. that. I love that. I've been sharing with uh, that kind of power jury, sometimes successfully and sometimes unsuccessfully for a long time. And I do think it really is enriching. And I certainly have grown a lot. So I'm glad to hear that story. And we'll finish up with uh, Jeanette and then move into the lesson. First of all, thank you so much, Jim and Jory, for the topic of power and I totally get it in NBC that external behaviors are never the cause of a feeling. However, I am very challenged by how much control technology, it's not a person, has over my ability to get through systems. And unconsciously I I don't want to give technology power, but it it has me going through lots of hoops to get through anything. Like I spent three hours trying to get a certificate for COVID to get on an airplane overseas. And it, it misspelled my name. How would I know that? So what I find technology is taking more and more of power over people. And I'm, I'm wondering about this because it's not, it's, it's okay. I'm not giving it power, but it's, it's, unfortunately, I, I don't know how to deal with that because I feel that I get frustrated when I can't get through systems that have glitches and then I didn't give it power, but how did, how did I get into this? So what do you do when it's technology? Oh boy, do a lot of mourning, huh? Yeah. Jory, well, it, it's puzzling to me how I. <laughs> it is. I know what you I'm mean. Sure. It's like it's like these things are are were designed to to save us time, and sometimes because of the way the the systems that are created, they end up um, seeming to take time, like entering passwords. Now I got to go look up my password. Oh, now I got to remember my password to get into my passwords, and you know there there are these layers of technology that we have built around us out of the need for protection, maybe, and other needs. And um, sometimes it's downright frustrating. I'm totally with you. But people on this, people as I walk around, people are all on their screens. It's not even passwords. It's, it's like I'm feeling we're all hijacked on some level. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm just being more aware of that lately. I, I can't solve it this. <laughs> I know that it's just something I'm noticing more and more. And it's just, uh, I'm mourning that. So thank you. I'm not sure that morning, I noticed it too. I mean, here I live in Maui and people of course bring their families here to vacation. And I'll, I'll I have this image in my head of sitting in a restaurant where um, here's this family of four or five people and they're at a, a restaurant they're probably never gonna be at in, for the rest of their lives. And they're all on their phones. You know, and they all they're all getting other, another way to get their needs met, but they're not, you know, I had a, I had a bunch of judgments come up, you know, I wanted to go and say, hey, man, you guys are in Maui, enjoy this food, enjoy this moment, enjoy that you've got, a, you know, all these, all this jackal was coming out of me, I, I managed to keep my mouth shut and just mourn. And, um, but I, I, I know what you mean, I, I. I actually feel pretty worried at times. Uh, we saw a movie a couple of years ago. I can't remember the name of it right now about um, Facebook. And then um, another one about, um, you know, there's all the stories about um, how the algorithms of TikTok and YouTube and so forth kind of capture our attention. And there is, I think you're, the word you use is strong hijacking. And uh, it's, it's actually pretty accurate. We because it's actually hijacking a, a part of our neurology, the dopamine system, mm -hmm. and it will just suck us right in. And to be aware of it is the first step. And then we have a little bit of choice about liberating ourselves in some ways. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, Zohar, you want something to add something? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to add uh, what Patricia said made me um 
get to another realization and maybe you can uh, relate to it um, because I have these books for nonviolent communication with children and I am practicing it with my child most of the time but I still hear this voice in the back of my head no you should teach her a lesson you're too soft and and it just what I just realized now is that okay so when I'm using these other strategies that I learned from the NBC I am still expecting that it will work to fix her so she will stop doing what she's doing and 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 maybe the and maybe this is also something to relate so when we are when we handle something with the tools of nbc ask ask ourselves are we expecting it to stop or are we open really to any outcome beautiful beautiful yep that sums it up right there in a whole uh, that so sums up the whole thing that's because of the old way we've been uh, programmed we might take these new tools and use them as a tool for domination and it's slippery it really is slippery i'm really glad that you noticed it that's another wake-up call yeah. yeah thank you okay tanya one more and then we'll get to the lesson maybe we're sharing power with you today this is what sharing power looks like by the way go ahead tanya i just want to go to the the um structural observation and that's it um if you live in if you live in north america you're building on a, a history of colonization and enslavement so why shouldn't you have this idea that you can fix people or punish them and get positive results yeah it's it's baked it's baked in it's baked into most of us yeah and uh, and, and most, a lot of the people in the other parts of the, the globe, they're, they're relating to colonization as well. And, and taking some, somewhere in their, in their history, people took, took control by force. And so it's baked in, it's baked in this, uh, in a culture, it's power over. And, you know, when, you know, Marshall and Walter Wink talked about, you know, talked about this, it's, it's it's very serious. It's not metaphorical at all. That we're we're enduring five thousand years of power over, and we're, we're trying to recover. Yeah, yeah. I wish I could argue with you, but I can't. <laughs> yes, thanks, Tanya. So let's just all take a moment of mourning, just to mourn these systems that inhibit our deepest desire to share power. to build a heart big enough to accept that these are the cards that we've been dealt. So as we transition into a little bit of content and a chance for you to do some writing and journaling and move to, I mean, sharing power is an extremely complex skill. It's the 25th one on the matrix. Now we're going to make it even, even more challenging. And once we under have an understanding of sharing power, now we can talk about roles. And so the skill today is called transcending roles. And again, if you're new to us, let me just say that these skills are part of a something called a pathways to liberation matrix of self-assessment that Jory and I, along with two other trainers, 
Jack Lehman and uh, Jake Gottwals. We wrote this about 10, 12 years ago now. It's a, a system of 28 nonviolent communication skills. And um, as, the, as we've gone, we've been, we started working on this skill set in October. It's okay if you're just coming in for the first time because every, every class is a standalone lesson. But for those of you who have been here from the beginning, you can see how the skills build on each other and create like um, uh, an interlocking system to help us build a, a life-serving way of being with ourselves and the, with others. So transcending roles refers to this idea that, that we are not the roles that we play and that we have choice about the roles that we adopt in, from moment to moment. And we have choice about how we respond to other people's roles. So we're gonna test that definition today to see if any of that's true for you. And you get to decide for yourself. All of the skills are set up with this kind of a pattern here where you know, if you're just walking into NBC uh, recently, you just became aware that there is a whole skill set called nonviolent communication. There's nothing wrong with that. You didn't know what you weren't aware of. That's called unconscious incompetence. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm, I'm unconsciously incompetent of millions of skills. And so <clears throat> that's just where we always start any kind of a journey towards learning more about a capability. And at some point we awaken to it. And usually the wake up call in nonviolent communication is some kind of suffering. We become aware of a kind of suffering or pain, discomfort, constriction in our lives. In this case, we become aware of how the roles we play or the roles we assign to others can contribute to suffering. And as we learn the skills of self-connection, honesty, and empathy, we, we realize we have choices that we may not have had before we understood about the skill. We move from reactivity to responsibility. And eventually with practice, um, at some moments, we naturally use a skill. It's like, we don't have to try to do it anymore. We actually do this, this last step, even before we become aware of the skill. It's babies are born with all these nonviolent communication skills. Nobody has to train a baby to be nonviolent. Nobody has to train a cat or a dog or a plant or a bee. All, all living things are inherently connected to needs, but because of the way we've been educated, we have lost connection with some of that um, natural state. So we're gonna explore how to get un unentangled, at least uh, from part of it today, in terms of roles. So start with, we always start with an observation when we practice NVC. So write down some labels that point to the roles that you play. So for example, I'm playing the role of trainer right now. I have another role, what might be husband, father, and so forth. So I'll be quiet for a couple of minutes while you make a list of all the roles that you could think of in your life.
as long as you got one or two on your list, that's fine. But if you want to keep write, writing them down as you realize them, that's also fine, of course. Second question, consider what needs are related to each role. What needs are you trying to meet when you play a particular role? So for example, when I have, when I consider my role of trainer, the needs that are alive in me are contribution, clarity, love, empathy, learning, growth, and so forth. I'm going to stop the share and put up a needs wheel. In case this is your first class, might be helpful to look at a list. You don't need a list, but sometimes some people find it helpful. There's some of the needs that we human beings share. So again, I'll be quiet for two minutes while you consider the roles that you play and how it relates to your needs. And then just savor these needs. Savoring means just to enjoy the pleasure of something. These needs are our connection to life itself. And we, we humans, because of the way we've been educated, don't often take the time to be mindful about this living energy. So you can even just pick one need and allow it, allow yourself to have a body based experience of what it's like to be connected to that need. And when you're connected to that need, you're connected to everybody else on the planet. These, this is beloved divine energy, as Marshall called it, connects us to every other living thing. Everybody 
has a need for safety, food, water, play, and so forth. So whatever need you choose, it's your, it's your way of connection to everybody in your universe. So is there a cost to this role? Are there, are there any needs that are not met for you when you play a particular role? Sometimes in my role of as trainer, I notice a potential cost. Um, a couple. One is um, sharing power with jewelry. If I'm talking, she's not, and vice versa. And if, so if both of us are showing up, sometimes I worry that my need for sharing power isn't being met. And same with my relationship with you all. While, while we're talking, you're not. I don't want to hog all the learning. So sometimes I worry that my need for our shared need for learning isn't met. So have some empathy for yourself for a couple of minutes as you consider any unmet needs related to the role. If you notice a sense of heaviness or constriction or pain as you connect to unmet needs, that's natural. It won't last. It's a dynamic process. See if you can open yourself, grow a heart big enough to feel those feelings of mourning. That's called mourning. Make room also grow your heart big enough to enjoy that needs are satisfied for you when you play these roles. Even with the morning in the one hand, you can celebrate the joy in another hand, like even even as I hold my unmet needs sometimes for shared power. I my need for connection is so met. And contribution is so met that I taste joy as well. So make, make your heart big enough to enjoy both the costs and the gifts of needs. And then shift gears again and think about how do you know when you're playing a role? Now you move to this skill of observing in NBC. What are the cues that you rely on when you play roles? In my case, again, it's so clear on Zoom. Zoom, Zoom cues my nervous system into the game I'm about to play. I see all your faces and brings back memories, awakened skills. What, what clues you into the role that you're playing?
some of these cues are built in biologically, like again, thinking of a newborn baby in, in the house. The baby cries and we spring into action as caretaker. We hear a sound or we look at a, something that tells us our baby is in distress or the baby that we're caring for is in distress and that cues us to play caretaker role. And we move into behaviors, actions to try to attend to the baby's needs. Other cues are cultural. So in some cultures, if uh, like we, Jory and I, sometimes we watch these period pieces on TV, you know, about um, English um, royalty or whatever, <clears throat> like Bridgerton. And, uh, you know, someone walks into the room and everybody stands up. So that's a cue, a cultural cue. Boss walks into the room. We all change our behavior, that's a cue. That's cultural. Maybe there's other kinds of cues that you're aware of besides biology and culture. Related to that is if you're not noticing the cues, what else are you noticing that might awaken you to the fact that you're playing a role? What other things might you observe in terms of either observations or feelings, body sensations, emotions? Jory, I sent you a little note in the chat. So about 30 more seconds to consider this. And as we transition from the written exercise back to self-connection, when you're ready, just notice what you learned from these cues, these prompts. What did you learn about the roles that you play, the observations and the feelings and the needs that are related to these roles. For some of you, you may be having the experience of, I don't know, I, I, I don't know what to think of it. That's fine, that, that's what you're learning is you don't know what to think of it. Some of you might say, oh, this is old, old news to me, that's fine. Celebrate, celebrate that. Maybe there's new insights emerging for some of you. Whatever, whatever your experience is, notice it, name it, and allow it. 
and then you get a chance to share about it with friends. So Jory's have made some small groups, maybe it made some adjustments because people have been coming and going. And we're going to do this for about 15 minutes. So now we go back to honesty and empathy again. So everyone has about five minutes. You might do more than one round. And uh, you can consider each of the questions individually or what you're taking away as a whole. You get to share power in your group. There's no assigned role of leader or follower. It's just three or four people getting together and hanging out, learning together. That's the goal. See what you can learn and how you can practice honesty and empathy together. And we'll come back in about 15 minutes. Jory, anything you need to say before they go? What's the clarity that the timer is 15 minutes, but there's a two minute follow up to do it until it totally closes. So just stay where you are there. It'll close automatically. And with that, we'll open a